So I'd like to thank you for, for joining me this morning. You might know from my writing and, and work that I've uh, I've come from the incident response community. So thank you for bringing me into your application security community, especially specifically the website. Um, when I get involved or my company, Mandiant, gets involved with these sorts of incidents, we're always well after the fact of, of an intrusion. And in fact, uh, our data from last year showed that we were somewhere in the order of 416 days as the median uh, time elapsed from when an intrusion had started and when a victim had brought us in to, to do something about it. So you've got well over a year of time that intruders are just roaming the network. They race to get credentials as quickly as possible and they're just taking data left and right before anybody even notices. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to start, you'll notice I don't have any slides because I don't uh, try to get away from slides as much as possible. I wanted to share with you sort of six big things that have happened in the last year because these six items are changing the way people think about our work. And I'm gonna use the sixth item to move into a discussion about that incident response work that I, I just mentioned. So I took a look at, I'm a historian by training. Uh, I, I do have uh, degrees from the Air Force Academy. They're Bachelor of Science degrees, but they're Bachelors of Science in History uh, because of all the engineering courses we had to take. So as a historian, I like to look back and see what has happened in the previous time and see if we, have, we can sort of get any lessons from that or even just say, these are the things that are happening and wow, when you think back, that's pretty amazing that all this has happened. Let's not take that for granted. So in the last year, the following have happened. First thing was in November, we had the US National Counterintelligence Executive release their latest report on espionage against the United States. And in that report, which you can get at ncix.gov, for the first time, the NCIX named two countries specifically as being the sources of economic espionage against this country. If you had read previous reports, you would find these countries listed in the appendix. You'd have case after case of, of prosecutions. But in the main text of the report, it was always, there are many serious competitors to the United States and we have to be vigilant against insiders and this and that. But they, the NCIX decided with the, the 2011 report to just come right out and say, the two countries we care the most about are China and Russia. The reason that's important is that prior to that point, those of us who were well aware of this and had been working this problem for the last decade, we had to use sort of euphemistic terms like our friends, uh, those guys in the Asia Pacific region, uh, those that are east of the Urals. And we had all these little code words that we would use to talk about these, these threat groups. And the reason was if you paired some of this information together, US government might consider it to be classified, which was really silly, but it was the reason why terms like advanced persistent threat were invented because the idea of taking a named intrusion set and matching it with the country that was responsible immediately classified that term as secret, so you, you couldn't use it. But once the NCIX came out and said, look, these are the two countries you care about, sort of took the gloves off and now we can talk about these problems. So that was the first one that happened that was really, wow, we can, we can finally talk about this as responsible adults. The second issue that's, that occurred was the release of new guidance from the Securities and Exchange Commission. And what the SEC said was that if you're a publicly traded company and Actually, what's happened is that they said, if you're a publicly traded company, you need to talk about whether or not you have cyber risk. And if something happens to you, you have to decide if that's a material event. And if it is, you need to tell your shareholders. When this guidance came out, they, the SEC said, this is not new information. You should have been thinking about this the whole time. Uh, we just wanted to, to clarify things. I doubt any of you are lawyers, but I have friends who are lawyers who were crazy when this happened. They said, this is gonna change everything. So I was nodding heads. This is gonna change everything, and it, it truly it has. But what's worse is it's gone even farther than what people anticipated. When we, when we read the SEC guidance, we thought, okay, if something happens, you should probably write about it in your disclosure statements. No problem. What's happened though, and I have a friend who just presented at our Mandiant uh, Mircon last week, He's done some research by mining the SEC's database, and I just tweeted out his, uh, his slides. My Twitter handle is TAO Security, if you wanna check up on that. What the SEC has done is they're just phishing companies for intrusion data. In other words, they, I mean, these are literal real cases that you can read about with real company names, and they're in the public, so I'm just gonna tell you who they are. Here's an example, Wynn Resorts. 
the, the hotel company. Apparently one day the SEC sat down and said, huh, we just read in the paper that there are hotel chains having intrusions. Wynn Resorts, you're a hotel chain. Have you had any intrusions? And Wynn Resorts has to answer. And if they come back and they say, well, no, they say, well, tell me about anything that has ever happened to you. Have you ever had a virus? Have you ever had a worm? Has, uh, this, is, this is happening. And it's not just an isolated case. Company after company, like for example, Walmart. Walmart, you're the world's largest retailer. Have you ever had an intrusion? Tell us about it. What did you do about it? And so it's not just material events that the SEC is asking about. They're, they're questioning, have you ever had anything? So if you're a publicly traded company and you don't know, you don't keep track of what's happened to you and what you did about it, you could have a, a fairly uncomfortable conversation with the SEC and it'll all be public because the SEC letters are posted on the SEC's uh, website. No, because the, the question was, can it just say yes or no? If you say that, the SEC will come back and say, tell us more about that yes or no answer. Or, we find your answer of no to not be sufficient. Please expand upon that. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the funny thing. You don't want to mess with the SEC. That's the problem for the companies. Um, I see this as a really big issue. And the reason is, the first sort of big driver we had for changing security was the uh, California SB 1386, which protected consumers when their PII was stolen. Now we have a class of activity that's supposedly gonna protect shareholders. And as someone who works at Mandiant, who sees that literally terabytes of data that are being stolen on a monthly basis from Western co companies all over the world, uh, I can tell you there are many companies that their, sh their share price should be going down if the world knew what was being taken from them. So the fact that these companies are gonna have to now say that, that's another one of these big uh, tectonic moves. And by the way, thank you, sir, for asking a question. If anyone has any questions at any time, please feel free to ask and we'll, we'll get through them. All right, so NCIX report, SEC. The third thing that happened was the publication of David Sanger's book, Confront and Conceal. And this is important, it happened in June. This is important because it blew the lid off of Stuxnet. And while Stuxnet came out two years prior to that, or at least people learned about it two years prior to that, and it was in many places. I mean, I, I worked at General Electric for four years. I created their incident response team. Uh, we had Stuxnet. It was there. Uh, but it just didn't do anything because it was well-coded and targeted very specific technology. So we found it, but okay, it's not, we're not running a Siemens PLC connected to uh, centrifuges in the Tons. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, but just think about that. The fact that the use of, and this is pretty much by any definition, this is a real cyber weapon. I mean, it, physical effect by, by a digital means. That's a real cyber weapon right there. The fact that people cannot talk about this, all of the, the policy community is buzzing about this. What do we do about it? Do we outlaw it? Wait, that was us. No, it wasn't. It was the Israelis. Uh, it's, that to me, that's another sort of, wow, when you think about it, that's a big deal. The fourth item, and I'll need, I have a little quote here to, to, to read associated with this, just happened, and this was Defense Secretary Panetta. And, of course, he trotted out the old war horse of the uh, cyber Pearl Harbor. Actually, he didn't say cyber, he just said Pearl Harbor, and then he linked it later to cyber, um, which I was listening to some, some uh, cyber experts on the Diane Reem show, because one of them was my friend, and I was listening, and she was amazed that, wow, the Secretary of Defense would get, you know, publicly say we're going to have a, a cyber Pearl Harbor. This is really amazing. And so I just thought back for a few days or for a few, to a few years ago, and I remembered and I found the references to um, Secretary of Defense John Hamry in 97 when I was a, uh, what was I? I was a lieutenant in the Air Force at that time. He was the one who was talking about electronic Pearl Harbor. And before that, six years prior, um, was Wynn Schwartow. So... The fact that a Secretary of Defense would use this term is not new. It's at least 15 years old. But what Panetta said after really caught my attention, and I, I wrote it down here to, to share with you. So he said, our mission is to defend the nation. We defend. We deter. And if called upon, we take decisive action to protect our citizens. In the past, we have done so through operations on land and at sea and in the skies and in space. 
In this century, the U.S. military must help defend the nation in cyberspace as well. If a foreign adversary attacked U.S. soil, the American people have every right to expect their national defense forces to respond. If a crippling cyber attack were launched against our nation, the American people must be protected. And if the commander-in-chief orders a response, the Defense Department must be ready to obey that order and to act. This was a big deal to me because I've been listening to these debates and statements for a long time. And the narrative you would usually hear is the following. Cyber Command, NSA, other components of the military slash intel defense uh, cyber world, they protect themselves. And to a certain extent, they protect the government. The D DHS protects, to a certain extent, US critical infrastructure. I mean, you, has anyone had a, a, D a DHS team deploy for an IR for them? OK. Yeah, DHS will send, if, you have a, if you're in critical infrastructure, DHS may send a team to help you, which is another step towards something that I, had, I w wouldn't necessarily have expected. But otherwise, if you're not government, you're not critical infrastructure, you're on your own. Private sector pretty much defends private sector. What Panetta was saying, though, is the Department of Defense exists to protect the citizens. And if we think something is going to happen, we're going we're gonna to act. And if necessary, we're going to act. I almost get a sense of sort of preemption there. And so some critics said, well, how is, how is DOD supposed to know that the you know, cyber launch is imminent and all these sorts of things? The way they would do it is they wouldn't use technical means, or at least they wouldn't use digital technical means. What they would do is they'd probably be inside the adversary's comm structure. They'd be watching their, their, their chatter. Every time you hear chatter talking about with the, the counterterrorism world, you know, they're in, in using SIGINT uh, and other means to figure out what's going on. But I think that's what would happen. They get word on some cell in some area, or there's a, uh, some part of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, or somebody decides, you know, here, we're going to take out some component of US critical infrastructure, DOD will now say, fine, we'll take that out. Or if they're going to go after private infrastructure, like a bank or a hospital, DOD is stepping up and saying, yeah, we're going to go forward and take these guys out, which, again, we're doing this for historical perspective. Wow, that is a big deal. That is not something that we've heard before. So that was Panetta. The next thing, and this is, this is number five of six, the fifth one was mention of hacking in a presidential debate. How cool is that? We had two, we had two debates where this came up. The most recent one was the, the so-called foreign policy debate uh, that was more, I, I couldn't understand. You're talking about teachers, and this is a foreign policy debate. You talk, anyway, we actually had the words hacking and cyber and uh, uh, Governor Romney saying the Chinese are hacking our computers, quote, uh, in, in the debate. Could you have imagined Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale talking about that, or, or John Kerry and George Bush? I mean, no, that just didn't happen. But now, it's a mainstream topic that comes up in a presidential debate. So I was, I was pretty much blown away by that. The last topic that has been something that has just changed the game is, in my mind as far as, as the way we do security is one that is actually about five years old, maybe about six years old, but it continues to this day. And I'm not going to ask for any hands to be raised to, to see if this has happened to you. But what I'd like to tell, tell you what it is and then take you through this experience. This is having a third party show up at your company's door and say, yes, do you work in the security department of company XYZ? You do? OK. Is this your data? And they, they will show you a printout of, of some directory listing or some files, or maybe they have a CD or a DVD of 55,000 password hashes or something to that effect. And you look at this and you say, what? So that's what I'd like to do right now. What I'm going to do is walk you through that experience because it's becoming ever more common. And our last year's uh, Mandiant M-Trans report, uh, of the cases we worked, 94% of them began as a result of a third-party notification. In other words, an agent from either the FBI, uh, NCI, uh, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, one of these organizations shows up at your door and says, we have your data. So I'd like to ask you, what do you do next? And I will play, the, I'm not wearing a suit today, because uh, I figured I'd dress down a little bit because I'm back in Texas. Um, but imagine I'm in a suit, I'm an agent, 
and I will answer your questions. So, is this your data? And you say, yes. What happens next? Where did we get the data? In the course of investigating an intrusion at another company, we were monitoring the network, and in the course of that uh, monitoring, we saw connections from your company's computers to our company, or to the company of the uh, computers of the company we were monitoring as a result of the investigation. Uh, so we saw the data coming from your company through this first company. That's how we got the data. Uh, I'm not currently at liberty to tell you who the other party was, but what I will tell you is they are a peer to your industry. Okay, so I just had a question. Could you tell me questions like uh, the IP address of the system that you saw transmitted data? Yeah, I'd be happy to show you that. I have the data right here. Here's the IP address that we saw coming from your company. That's how we were able to identify your company as well as looking at the data itself. So I can give you that information, no problem. Uh, let's go here and then here. Where did the data go from there? Uh, we, we saw the data transfer from your company to company A, uh, then to uh, the first tier of what we track as generally a four tier architecture um, that we tend to believe the ultimate endpoint is uh, People's Republic of China. And, sir? Uh, when did you first see the our data from? And when did you last see, or is it still stolen? We saw this data transfer occur three days ago. Uh, during, since then, we have not seen any more data transferred. But that does not mean that more won't go out in the coming days. And it doesn't necessarily mean that data previously didn't get transferred. We just weren't in a position to see it. No, I'm not telling you six months later. By the way, if you're, if you're in this, I'll step out of my agent suit for a second. If you're in this process and I come to you and tell you about this and you don't care, what the agents that I've talked to have said, they'll generally try maybe three or four more times to find out if anybody cares. And if at the end of five times of notification and getting no response, they just ignore you. Or they, they no longer notify you is what I should say. So that doesn't mean the problem stops. It just means they've decided that they're going to expend their resources on a company that's more interested in solving the problem. How often does that happen? The question is, how often does that happen? I don't know. I actually don't know. I, it's, it's happened enough for them to tell me that they have a, an R or you know, rules of engagement associated with it. Does that happen in partner organizations where they're just not talking to the right people or they're having a hard time finding the right people? Or in smaller, larger relationships? Oh, OK. So the question was, what sort of organization tends to ignore this activity? My experience has been you get both large and small. At the large side, uh, you have companies that say, look, we are company blah. We've been around for 100 years. The Great Depression didn't put us out of business. This isn't going to put us out of business, so we don't worry about it. And then 10 years later, you have Nortel. So I mean, there's that sort of thing. I've also heard small companies say, look, we are a think tank. Uh, everything we do eventually is published, so what's the point? Or wh what's the big deal if the Chinese are inside of our network? Now, the issue there is trust. Because I've had some, just to use a think tank example, I've had some think tanks that say, well, wait a second, what do we actually do? What is it, what is it we do as an organization? We interview people, we have conversations with people, sometimes we talk to dissidents, we talk to policymakers. If we get a reputation of we can't protect that communication, no one's going to want to talk to us. So even though we publish our research, the stuff that, that you know, the raw data that goes into that research, if, if nobody, nobody can trust the confidentiality, I mean, think about a reporter. If the reporter can't protect the background nature of some of their sources, the sources aren't going to speak. So we've had that conversation as well with some of these organizations. Am I, Sir? Am I in trouble? Are you in trouble with the government? No. Well, you are not in trouble with the government. We are here to help. From the government, we're here to help. <laughs> Honestly, it, it is the only thing that I have seen in the last five or six years that has made a huge difference. So yeah, I do believe these guys are, are there to help. I don't know if any of you are from the Bureau, but uh, the quality and the experience of the agents that are now working this problem, very high. Very, I mean, I've sat down with some of their section chiefs and unit chiefs, 
and they start throwing TCP IP at me, and I'm like, whoa, where did you come from? So I've been very impressed uh, in recent years. Uh, let's see, so here, and then I'll work, sir. Good question. So is, could this result in a criminal case? Uh, in our experience, these cases generally do not result in a criminal prosecution uh, unless the following happens. Um, if we identify someone who is working inside your company, then we could prosecute them criminally. So just to think about the NCIX report, all of the cases the NCIX report tends to list were cases where so-and-so was caught at Chicago O'Hare with either a USB drive or a CD or a DVD full of stolen documents. And as they were getting ready to fly overseas, they were intercepted and then that resulted in a criminal, criminal prosecution. We don't have the capacity or really any cooperation or ability to reach into somebody else's country and pull out their agents, pull out their operatives. And to tell you the truth, I don't think I would necessarily want that anyway. To think about them doing that to us even though we don't target the same sorts of information, I wouldn't want them to come say, oh, well, you got a bunch of guys working up near Fort Meade that we identified and we want to pr criminally prosecute them. Oh, that's probably don't want to have that happen. Uh, man, yes? Okay, great question. So in how many cases do you do some type of you called it uh, a, a stealthy cleanup, so you leave things going to try to observe versus doing some sort of immediate response. All right, I'm going to put on my Mandiant hat here because this is what this is my experience and also my experience previously in other companies. Um, the worst answer for this problem is immediate cutoff, because when we engage on any, or when any of you find this ha is happening, or any of you engage on this problem. It really is that tip of the iceberg. And if you decide that, let's, let's say for example, you get an indication that this computer is compromised here. Generally, this computer is one of, of could be 50, 100 computers that are compromised and also have tools on them, let alone the fact that your whole Active Directory domain is probably also compromised. So that means every computer in the room is now at risk and may have already been logged into. So the worst thing you can do is to say, hey, we found this one system, let's, let's cut it off without knowing what the scope of the problem is. And this is where you can sort of think, if you're an incident responder, the first thing you need to figure out is the scope, how big is the intrusion, and then that drives everything else. Scope and then remediation actions. So what we recommend, and this at times can sound contradictory depending on who you're talking to from a company like Mandiant, the first thing we recommend is to say, what is, figure out what the scope of the incident is. Because once you figure out the scope of the incident, that's when you can decide on a remediation action. Because what you're going to find is, at least let me walk you through the ways you, you deal with this problem. Um, the traditional incident response method is to do the following. And this isn't bad, by the way. We did this for years. This is what I learned. But there's better ways now. You find that this computer is compromised. You then say, this computer, um, who, else, who else have you connected to? All right, I find it's connected to those computers. Then I pull on that thread. Who else have you connected to? I pull on that thread. Or uh, computer, who have you talked to on the internet? OK, you've talked to those 20 systems. Who else has talked to those 20 systems? And you sort of do this sort of unraveling of this web of activity. And that's fine. And many people still do that. And you probably still need to do that. But what we would say when we do an incident response is something a little bit different. We would do that stuff as well. But the other thing that we add is this. We'd say. Hey, computer, what are the indicators of compromise that this machine has a problem? And you build up that list of indicators of compromise. And then, and we do this with our software. This isn't a commercial for Mandia, but this is the way we do our work. We then say, every computer in the room, tell us if you have those same indicators of compromise. And you sweep the whole place. And when you do that, you find that bunch over there, a few back there, 10 over there, five over here. And then you analyze those, say, 30. And you say, what are your indicators of compromise? Oh, I just got 10 more IOCs. And then you sweep again. And you continue that iterative process until you have every computer identified, every account that's identified, every stolen VPN account or whatever. And then once you have all of that, you execute remediation. That's what it means to discover the scope of an intrusion. Now, 
those, and I'll get you in a second, sir. The problem is many times it, the, in the larger the organization, it is difficult to pull that off. Uh, at General Electric, we had a serious incident, uh, or I should say it was a campaign directed against us in 2008. And I knew the first time we tried to deal with it, it was gonna fail. We weren't ready technically, procedurally, tool-wise, everything about it was gonna fail. So I nicknamed it Linebacker One. And I don't know if anybody has any military history background, but Linebacker One was a total failure bombing campaign in Vietnam. But I said, I know this is gonna be a failure. In fact, I, I guess that the second one would even be a failure, because we wouldn't be able to learn the lessons fast enough to do something about it. So Linebacker One failed. In fact, we had evidence that the intruders copied or got a copy of the IR plan, the, the remediation plan, prior to it executing. The, way, the reason we knew that was we said, okay, we're gonna kick off this, this uh, activity on a Friday night, seven o'clock, and we'll start our, we'll, you know, cut off the network and do all our work. Friday morning, they started expanding their activity. They changed all their tools, they changed their user, everything was, was changed, and so we, we totally blew linebacker one. A couple months later, we tried linebacker two, S similar sort of thing, it was a complete failure. Um, I'm sorry, I just totally messed that up. The first one was Rolling Thunder, that was a failure. Then we did Linebacker 1, that was a failure. Then Linebacker 2, which if you remember, that Linebacker 2 was actually uh, successful. So that's what we were able to do. By the time we did this the third time, we had some success against these guys. Um, but that gets into a whole other issue of what is, how do you define success. Uh, sir, you had a question? Great question. So the, the question was, what's the motivation of this group? Um, this group appears to be one of the threat groups who targets intellectual property. Um, we've, we've seen other groups that, that either operate uh, against dissidents or um, business practices or whatever, but they appear to have selected you because you have a form of technology that they're interested in. Uh, you're also involved in one of their, their 10 key industries, so we think that might be a factor and they're interested in improving the general quality of their own technology. So we see that you're a leader in that field and that's an issue that they've been working on is, is just general quality improvements. Yes, be flattered. <laughs> Sir? What do you suggest you do next? What do, okay, well, the question is what do I suggest you do next? Uh, unfortunately, the FBI is not in a position where we can help you do anything to that effect. Uh, we stay busy. Um, Notifying people, which is a huge job. I mean, if, if, stepping out for a second. If you could see the number of cases. I mean, right now, Mandy is working 12, 14 ongoing cases, like serious several month intrusion cases, and we'll just keep, we just, the phone just keeps ringing. Um, so, so putting back my suit, uh, my, my agent suit, what I would recommend that you do is you uh, either take a look at your own incident response team and evaluate if they're capable of of organizing a response against a, a, a campaign of this type, or you may want to consult with a third party organization that specializes in this sort of work. <coughs> Mandiant, um, <laughs> that, that might be helpful. You might wonder, by the way, when do we get involved? We often do get involved at that next step. The other way that we get involved is when another team has gone in and they fail like month after month. And I've heard some cases where like, one, two, three million dollars have been spent and they haven't made a single dent in the bad guy. And that's when, yeah, so well, you've made a dent in your pocket, you know, your wallet, but you haven't made a dent in the bad guy. And that's, that's difficult. I had another question. Sir, yes. Yeah, taking off your scenario back here. Sure. Um, I'm from Canada and we've had a, a fairly serious incident where critical infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. And two years ago, we had an incident and two years now, So the question was about cooperation between Canadian, uh, I guess, uh, law enforcement, but still the national security, the uh, LE side, and the United States. I would say that Canada is one of the Five Eyes countries, so US, UK, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia. 
Um, so to the extent that we cooperate with anyone, we do our best cooperation with those other four countries. Um, so what could an individual company do to, to say, promote more cooperation? Is there anything or Well, so the, the things, the, what we recommend individual companies do, and I was part of one of these collaborations at, at General Electric, we recommend two sorts of collab, well, there's many sorts, but I'll name a couple that work. One of them is to collaborate with your peer companies. Because if you're in, say, automobile manufacturing, or you're in clean energy, or you're in uh, high-end manufacturing, or whatever, or you're oil and gas, energy, I'm yeah, discussing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you are being targeted. You, and in fact, you've probably been compromised for years because this is an ongoing issue. So the best thing, we've, what we've seen is the companies that are in these industries, they get their lawyers together, they all come up with some kind of language that, that, that shields them against collusion, and they come up with rules that make sure that when they're talking to each other, they're not discussing pricing, product, strategy, et cetera. It's strictly for the technical exchange of information. And then they say, we're all being hit by the same actors, let's share what we know about that. So that's one model that I've seen work very, very well. Peer, peer certs talking to each other. We had a, something like that with uh, Ford, as an example. We did something with Lockheed Martin, a couple of the other sort of large company certs that we were dealing with. Uh, the second model is to see if there's some sort of, of government-sponsored structure that you can join. In the US, there was something called the Defense Industrial Base Portal. And this was an organization where individually, I as a person had to sign, sign, my bad hand, I had to sign a legal document that said, here's how I will handle this information, I won't leak it, and so forth. And that got ahead of a lot of the issues that we saw with information sharing, because I was personally responsible. And that worked very well. The third thing that you can do is there's many, uh, well not many, there's a few good private lists where people share this sort of information. And I'll tell you right now, it's not like a LinkedIn group called APT. You're not gonna get that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> You're not going to get the good stuff there. But there are some private lists where if you can sort of identify what, where those are and get vetted and join, uh, that's where people talk about these issues. And you'll find a, a good amount of cooperation there. Any other questions? Okay. So that third-party notification has been, the, to me, one of the biggest drivers of, of improving security that I've seen in the last several years. Because once you get one of these agents, they visit, it just, everything changes. Uh, yeah, sir. And what's the ultimate outcome of the, say, testing scenario, yeah. scenario? So what a great question. The question was, what is the outcome of one of these, one of these visits? Well, what you find, at least this has been my experience, uh, my direct experience now for several years with this sort of issue, is that it never goes away. That's probably the biggest change that I've seen in IR in the last, uh, say, 10 years. I can remember in 2002, uh, I worked for Foundstone. I, was, I worked for the incident response team, Kevin Mann, the other, there were five of us. Kevin was our leader. And we can, I can remember with Kevin trudging out of this one company. We've just been beat down. We've been working for weeks and weeks trying to kick these bad guys out. And we kind of look at each other and, you know, win some, we lose some, you know? And we're like, oh, man, that was a really tough one. But we eventually did kick these guys out. But that used to be the old model was you'd say, okay, you'd, you'd serve really hard for week after week after week, you'd kick them out, and then that would be it. And in some cases, the customer would retain us to sort of watch and make sure they didn't come back. If they did come back, we'd take efforts to kick them out again, but eventually they'd give up. In, in one case, we worked, uh, it was a Romanian, and uh, his name was Kalen Mateish, and eventually we think uh, the organized crime group that he was with, we think they decided he was no longer useful because he had lost access to the companies that we had kicked him out of. So we never saw him again for, for kind of sad reasons, I think. Um, same thing with the Russians. The Russians tend to back off. Once you've found them and kicked them out, they back off at least for a while until they think you're not watching, and then maybe they try to work on you again. The Chinese are different. The Chinese, you kick them out on Friday, and they're, they're fishing you again on Saturday and Sunday, and they're back in on Monday if they're not back in earlier. So. What we've seen is that it's less about being in a state of compromise and then getting clean again. It's more about always being compromised, and this is where the security after compromise or security after incident part of the talk is, is important. It's less about, 
ever getting to some sort of pristine nature of your network. And it's more about saying, once we become aware of a problem, we can scope it very quickly, we can scope it accurately, and then we deal with it quickly. When I worked at General Electric, um, we had a meeting with our CIO, and this was like touching the sun. You know what I mean? Because 300,000 people in the company, the CIO reports directly to Jeff Immelt, who's you know, the president's, cyber, you know, president's job czar. So you know, the floors are all nicely, you know, w real wood on the floor, and I'm walking in his office. Yes, Mr. Reiner, it's so nice to be here. And so we had this meeting, and, and he said, by the way, the fact that the CIO would be meeting with me, the director of incident response, was just a really awesome deal. The fact that my analysts were with me was, was pretty cool. So he said, tell me about this incident response program. What's going on? I heard you know, you're telling me that the, the Chinese and the Russians are here, and what are we going to do about this? And so I proceeded to tell him what our program looked like. And he said, well, what do you need from me? What, what do you need from me as the, as the CIO? And this guy was brilliant, by the way. Every question he was asking, he already knew the answer. He was like, he was a, he was like a, a chess master. He was like six moves ahead of everybody. The only guy I ever met that I, you know, I had to pick up my notes when he walked in the room because it my I sort of blank out for a second. So he, he already knew the answer to all these questions he was asking. So what I told him was, I said, we need better support from the businesses to get our program through because right now um, it just takes us too long to go from finding a compromised system or account or whatever to doing something about it. He's like, well, tell me, how, how long is it taking? And we said, ah, it's taking about three weeks. Three weeks? You mean to tell me you find a compromised system and it's, it's on the network for three weeks? Uh, yes, sir. He's like, I want that down to an hour. Anywhere in the company, one hour from detection to containment. And I thought, whoa, when I looked at my boss who was a CISO, we were like, oh my god, <laughs> one hour. So, but the thing was, that changed everything for us. And the reason was he didn't say, okay, here's what I want. I want you to roll out tool X, and I want you to use process Y, and I want you to talk to Cisco. And I'll, No, no, no. He's like, this is what I want. The outcome I want is one hour. I don't care how you get there. Just get to one hour. So what that did was it freed us up to say, well, look, this is what Gary Ryder wants. He wants one hour. However you get to that, businesses, go at it. Just... Just figure it out. So we had, you know, one business bought a whole bunch of tools. One business hired like a thousand Indian contractors. One business, uh, I'm serious. You know, they were like, they basically bought some company in India and said, "Your job is to do nothing but chase systems down in one hour." Yes, we will do that. Okay. Uh, we had another company that said we're going to ramp up our help desk. We had another business that, you know, did all these different results, and then we measured it and we tracked it. And when you should know, after about nine months, we got down to an hour. So that to me was, was really uh, what I would recommend to you. If you're going to have any type of security program, you need to be able to answer two questions. Count what's happened and classify it. So we had an intrusion of this type, we had a DDoS attack of this type, we had an application failure of this type, whatever it is. And then count your time to deal with it. How long from when the event occurred to when you were able to deal with it. And over time, you want to see both of those numbers go down. A good security program is one that over time, you have less bad things happening, and any bad thing that happens, you deal with it quicker. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about number of vulnerabilities. I don't care about number of antivirus hits. I don't care about how many things were blocked by the firewall. I don't care about any of that. All I care about is stuff that's happened and how quickly you dealt with it. And then from that, you can sort of derive business impact and all the other things that, that you might have to worry about. Yes? So that's a good question. How often are the third party visits not from the government? In other words, how many ambulance chases are there? Um, we see this quite a bit. We, in fact, we see it so much that uh, at the Mandiant blog, we did uh, uh, a post, actually several posts on this topic. Um, what does it look like when you get a third party notification from someone else? What are some good ones? What are some bad ones? And if you get one, what should you ask? So I do know that there are some ISPs who will do these notifications, and the ISP ones are terrible. They, they're, we think that you're being hacked by the Chinese, and there's like 10 pages of text, all these things, and like, here's our Nessus scan of their C2 server. I mean, whoa, whoa, what is all this? So there are some organizations, some companies out there that are doing notifications. Uh, I'd, I'd point you to our blog to see you know, what are some things you can look at, uh, ask them, 
different questions and, and find that out. Yeah, blackmail. So, okay, Bla let's talk about blackmail in the last two minutes that we have. This is an interesting issue. I've dealt with a case recently that affected my own company that you may have thought would, be, would have been blackmail. Um, do you guys remember a re security researcher who said he had registered a bunch of type mis you know, mistyped domains and he was intercepting the email when people would mistype the email address? And then he would notify you that you had this, and uh, reports vary. Some people said, you know, for a reasonable donation, I will turn these domains over to you, others, whatever. Well, that happened to us. And I dealt with this kid, and I got him to give us the domain for free. And that was it. And he never, never bothered us. So I think you, you have to be careful with some of these cases. In some cases, if you just handle them gently, it'll be fine. Other cases, yeah, if you're dealing with a no kidding we want money from you, then at that point, I would just call law enforcement. Because at the point where they're asking for money, then you have a way to get at them. Because you could generally set up some operation and, well, we and target them. Yeah. Thing to do. But I'm just, yeah, that's a really unfortunate case. That the, um, the SMB part of our industry there is no good answer for them. Other than, I've, I've actually dealt with some that we've talked about setting up a cooperative. Like you're all, a com each of you has about 100 employees. Individually, you can't defend yourselves, but collectively, if you bought as a group, maybe if you shared infrastructure, did those sorts of things, you could be big enough to sort of get some scale. That might be. Yeah. It's great. It's kind of like the Wild West where you had to get everyone's wagons together. I think that's, uh, the best thing we can hope for. I think I'm out of time. It's 1045. Uh, it just said out of time. Great. So I will be here. I'll hang out um, for a little bit. It's been very nice to talk to you. Thank you for coming here to this presentation. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.